Hey, are you a top laner who is hard stuck and struggling to find a good pick top lane? Do you have nothing to blind pick in every champ select because you will always have some sort of unlosable lane? Well, good job for clicking on this video because today I will tell you why Timo is the champ for you. I think Timo is extremely busted, he's playable into every matchup that you want to and you should abuse him for late season LP to get the rank that you want, be it Emerald, Platinum, Diamond or if you are good enough you could even get Challenger just like me. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of- Alan! Well, who am I? I'm a Challenger Timo one trick. And I have been challenger since season 9, I actually peaked it in season 6 as well. So in my opinion, I am the best Teemo and in the Teemo community, I'm the best Teemo in the world. But there's no one, no one better to give you good advice. Why am I the best Teemo in the world? Since he doesn't have any mechanics, right? I'm extremely adaptable, I know how to win games, what my win conditions are. I always have a plan whatever game I go into and I have decent enough mechanics to outplay even challenger players. And all of this is something that I want to show you. To give you a little bit more proof, I had Challenger once again a week ago with a 72% win rate. And uh, yesterday, actually, I hit 1300 LP, which means that uh, for a time, I was the second highest ranked top laner in all of Europe. I hope that you can learn a lot and let's begin. Why is Timo so strong? I actually think that Timo is in general a very strong champion, especially because he is one of the ranged top laners who abuses fleet footwork the most and the easiest. He always deals the most damage in any game, he is very fast, his hitbox is very small so you can dodge a lot of abilities and he has so many different uses. He can be a perfect Trindamir like split pusher or an Anivia like zone control teamfighter or an Ash like Marksman backliner. Whatever you need, Timo can fulfill the role. He is a lane bully who is very strong in the early game and can dictate the pace of the lane, but he's also an extremely good late game champion. In my opinion, the, a top 5 best scaling uh, champion in the game. I actually have a video on that, you should check it out in the top right. Timo, unlike a lot of uh, top laners, can basically be played into every matchup and you're saying, oh Alan, what about Cassiopeia? What about Ryze? What about Dragas? What about Aatrox? All these difficult matchups. I think you can play all of them and you can be more useful than the enemy. But that's why Timo is really good and even though I'm a good player, I think I'm literally abusing Timo and so should you. So let's begin with the basic setup for Timo. First of all, we should start with keystones. Auto Timo is actually one of the champions that can basically use all the keystones in the game, or most of them. However, in the precision tree, only PTA and lethal tempo and fleet footwork are really worth it. Lethal tempo is okay only into Warwick, and Conqueror is okay if you want to have fun. Domination. Electrocute kinda got nerfed too much, Dark Harvest takes too long, Predator is a meme and Tail of Blades is too flippy. In the Sorcery Tree, Aerie is pretty decent, Phase Rush is very good into certain matchups and Co Comet is just a worse version of Aerie. Resolve Tree, Grasp used to be really good but Fleet Footwork is just a better version and these two runes Timo can't proc. The Inspiration Tree is fun, I, the Unsealed Spellbook is kinda funny but in general it's not very valid. So in the end you have four potential room choices that you can pick. Lead Footwork, PTA, Airy, or Phase Rush. In my opinion, if you sh would just choose one, I would just always go Fleet Footwork. This is my main rune page, we go Fleet Footwork. I prefer Presence of Mind because then you never have mana issues. Legend Alacrity gives you a lot of mana. And against tanks you can go cut down, but in general Last Stand is the mathematically best rune. Sorcery Tree, you can technically go like Second Wind, Unflinching, Overgrowth if you feel like it. Or Cheap Shot deals a lot of damage, Taste of Blood for the lane and then Ultimate Hunter. But I prefer to have Celerity because it uh, buffs up your fleet footwork. And then Scorch, I don't like so much and we don't need Mana Flow Band because we have Presence of Mind. So you can go Nimbus Cloak or Gathering Storm. I prefer Gathering Storm. Your minor runes are basically always going to be attack speed, adaptive force and HP. I think HP is just better scaling than armor and MR, but you can choose it based on your enemy. If you go PTA, it's a similar matchup. This is what an NA player called Taiji, formerly Young Tappy plays. 
And here's a slightly different setup, which you can also copy if you feel like it. This is a setup that Arthur Launches does a lot. This is the setup that we're going to use when I talk about Qmax. It's very focused on shroom damage and having a lot of AP. So here we go actually go absolute focus and cheap shot, unlike in the Fleet Footwork page. And in Phase Rush, we're all about that movement speed. So Nimbus Cloak and Celerity. And also, uh, since it's often a very defensive setup, you can go on Flinching Bone Plating, for example. This is also a viable option. Items. Um, I used to be a big proponent of Dorn's Ring and to Pots, and actually all of the Dorn's items get buffed in like one patch or something, big big changes. However, I still think even after the changes, Dark Seal Refillable Potion is just the best setup you can go. Why? Because Dark Seal is one of the most gold efficient items in the game. If you start to snowball, this is what enables the snowball and what really makes the game go out of control. If you have ever have a game where you're doing well and you don't have Dark Seal, you regret it so much. Also, usually, if you buy two pots, you end up buying refillable potion anyways, so you're just wasting 100 gold. So always go these two runes. If I base on like 450 gold or 750, I would buy coal or boots and coal and just farm a lot. In terms of boots, for my setup, you basically only go boots of swiftness. However, sock shoes are also very good, especially if you're the only AP damage dealer. And Berserker's Greaves are okay if you go PTA. If you want the PTA setup, they are fine. These um, boots I mentioned, but 99% of games, it's actually better to just dodge everything and to be fast, especially because these boots are cheaper than to go Mercs or play the Steel Cap. So unless they have like 5 AP and 5 AD, I would not recommend those boots for you. Now, what are my core items? The items that I love the most in the game are for sure Landry and Zonia. If I would only go two items in the entire game, I would go Landry and Zonia. Landry provides ability ace mana, so you never have any mana issues. It is extremely good in team fighting with all the passives on the shrooms, but it also allows you to clear a bunch of waves with your shrooms. Zonia gives very good uh, stats with ability ace, armor, and AP. And also, if you use the active correctly, it can just straight up win you games. Finally, Void Staff, very gold efficient item. Very often, people are actually gonna build MR, and you only need like one person buying Merc Threads for it to already be gold effective against him. And especially if we don't go uh, Sock Shoes, we wanna have some pen to actually deal some damage. Lately, I've been experimenting with Crown after it got buffed, and I actually think it's pretty good in a lot of matchups where people jump onto you, like the Rengar, the Jax. I'm, I'm actually liking this a lot, and I will keep you updated with how I like this. Now, these are items that are, in general, pretty good, and I also like them. However, they're kind of situational. Woodsend and Nashor are your DPS items. I would just go Woodsend if I feel like I need movement speed or I need MR else Nasher is okay. The thing is that these items, in my opinion, are luxury items that you go if the game is going really well. If your game is going poorly, you're gonna lose too much going these two items. Banshee is very nice in AP matchups and the Death Cap is one of those. Like the game's going very well, I want the third item, give me Rabadon. Morello, I'm mostly thinking about Oblivion Orb here. Oblivion Orb is a game that I go in like 80% of my games just because Poison and AoE Shrooms are so good at applying it and every champion kind of has healing. It's actually pretty strong. Finally, the last items that you should consider sometimes. In my opinion, these are the only items you need. But like if you want some sort of other items, then Hexec Pro Belt is pretty fun if you go a full uh, Magic Pen build with Electrocute if you feel like it. Riftmaker is good with PTA. Shadow Flame is good against Enchantress like Sona. Demonic Embrace is if you are stuck in the game, you don't know what you're doing and you just want some HP, some AP, it's okay to go. Cosmic Drive is another item. If you have too much money and you're winning, sure, go Cosmic Drive, it's very fun. And Lich Bane, at this point, in my opinion, it's a worse version of Cosmic Drive, but it's an okay item. If you build it, I'm not gonna flame you. And then I didn't do this, but for example, one very common build that I go with Fleet Footwork is that in my opinion, Timo deals enough damage in a game. So I just go these items. I have a ton of ability haste, decent enough AP, right? All of them give 80 AP. I have a lot of defensives and I will be very useful despite my lack of DPS. Of course, if you're going some sort of PTA build, then you're probably gonna want uh, Nasher 
Rift Maker and then Zonya or Deathcap if you go with the Young Fappy setup. This is like one example build that I would very often go. Summoner spells. Now, there are a lot of potential summoner spells that you could go, but really don't overthink it. 99.9% .9 Flash, Ignite are gonna be your best options. Sometimes I have gone like exhaust against a Z top lane or like ghost when I was worried about the gank setup of an Orn. But in general, like don't worry about it. Flash Ignite are gonna be good enough. The reason why you're not climbing is not because of your summoner spells. Just go these two, don't overthink it. I will teach you how to play without TP. As for your abilities, what should you take first? What should you max? And basically, if you want to 99% of games, this is going to be fine for you. Point in E, your passive uh, poison. Then a point in Q, your blinding dart. Then a point in W, move quick. You just get faster. And then you max E, Q, W. If you want to, just do this every game. It's completely fine. You max E because it deals a lot of damage and CSing becomes a lot easier. Now the question is, a question that I very often get is, do you max Q or W second? And the thought process behind this is very simple. If you believe that you're gonna be using your blind a lot, or you have a very damage focused build, then max your Q because it deals more damage and you're gonna use your blind. If you feel like you wanna be faster around the map and your blind is not that useful this game, for example, against an Orn, against most tanks, then max your W. Your W is also good to run people down. If you want to be auto-attacking a lot, which you would do with a PTA build, then max W. A very niche option that you can go, especially against like ranged top laners like Quinn, Cannon, Vayne, is you can put two points in E. This is to make sure that you can see as well. And then you max Q, then W, then E. This is a poking setup that you would go with Airy. Those are the three basic options for your max order. So now let's get into a practice game against the Mordekaiser, a matchup that some of you guys would really struggle into and show you how to win games as Teemo. First, I want to talk about a little bit what your win condition in most games are and yeah, how you should approach the game as Teemo. League of Legends in general is a pretty simple game, just the execution is really hard. What are your goals in lane? Very simple. You want to get as much farm as possible, or that you need to be in the lane as much as possible. You want to get as many plates as possible while denying the enemy plates. Plates are very, very, very powerful and a lot of gold. So every plate that you get in the lane is a huge win. As a top laner, you want to secure Herald, which means you want priority. Priority simply means that you are the one pushing the lane when Herald is spawning so that you can move to the Herald. And finally, you want to snowball. I want to preface all of this. There's a good friend of mine called, called Alois was a series on, of fundamental League of Legends concepts. And he talks a lot about base timers, level timers, matchup knowledge, vision, etc. All of these fundamental League skills are transferable to Teemo. And if you are a good Teemo player, a, a good League of Legends player, you will be a good League player. I will not be talking about anything revolutionary. Another very important concept that he talks about is that you should really focus on your early game because League of Legends is 10 times easier when you are winning. That sounds stupid, but it makes a lot of sense. If you are the one snowballing, every decision is easier, you get punished less, etc. You want to really focus on having a good early game because mid game and late game becomes 10 times easier. I really don't teach those concepts so much, what you do in the mid game, what you do in the late game, because most of them get decided by what happens in the early game and your decision making is impacted by, hap by what happens in the early game. So if you feel like you are hard stuck, really make sure that you do not fuck up your lane in the first four levels. And I'm gonna show you a very easy way, which I used in this matchup, to get through the four first levels and to really set you up for the future. In general, Timo is a lane bully, but we're gonna use this lane bullying to get advantage, uh, get advantages through CS, through plates, through XP, 
through hell, through enemy jungle camps, but not necessarily through killing. We're gonna be poking the enemy just to get him low to force him to TP so that he can't join plays, he has to play back and everything else. You do not need to kill your enemy, all you need to do is to be strong yourself because Timo actually outscales most top laners in the game. As I'm loading into this game, I'm against the Mordekaiser and here I want to show you something. I actually straight up went cool this game and I didn't even buy pots. This is because I know if I play correctly, this Mordekaiser, who is a Grandmaster player, right? Very good player. He is not going to do anything to me. Another thing that I want to show with you is that a lot of the times you waste precious gold. Every single time that you miss a minion, you should be thinking minus 20 gold. If you think about it like that, like if you think about should I harass the enemy champion or take a minion, you should be thinking would I pay 20 gold to deal 70 damage to the enemy right now. Usually I wouldn't do that. And here I take a pot because I, I don't take a pot because I know that I'm probably not going to need it. And by being efficient with your gold, you get your item sooner. If you get your item sooner, you get your next item sooner. And that's how you snowball. So don't waste your gold. You can't just go cool into every matchup, of course. If it's an easy matchup, you can just go cool. And if it's a more difficult matchup, always go Dark Seal and Refillable Potion. So that you make smart use of your money. So as we're turning into the game, we're going to be talking a lot about wave management because that's basically all that is about lane macro. Of course, you need to track the enemy jungler, pay attention where they are, if they can gank you, what the gank setup of the jungler is. But in general, I never leash, rule number one. If you leash, you're, you're basically always making the game harder for yourself. Junglers are going to hate me for this, but honestly, in this season, they don't need it so much. Don't leash. You want to be in the lane early because you want to. what you want to prevent at all costs is the wave being pushed into you. The one who controls the wave at the first three or four minutes of the game very often dictates the rest of the pace of the entire lane, depending on what the junglers do. You can do level one cheeses. For example, I could have gone and passive here and then maybe gotten some auto attacks on the Mordekaiser as he is moving over. However, I usually just check so that we don't get invaded and I just walk with my minions. If you walk with your minions, then also usually if there's like an Irelia or a Riven or whatever, if they want to cheese you level one, then you are with your minions. They're going to focus them and they're all in this, this weaker. Now, I usually auto tag one minion because I don't want all three minions to be the same HP since all I have to CS with are my auto attacks. I want one creep to die earlier than the others. I also want to ensure that I push, but I don't want to just hard push the wave. You usually do a third wave or fourth wave crash into the tower because that allows you to base and then in general be safe if you need to be. So in general, I auto attack this minion twice and then I just chill. I try to see as minions as late as possible to build as big of a wave up as possible so that then I can harass the, um, the enemy top laner away from the minions at level one as much at level like two or three as possible. Also, when I'm blue side, I do the same thing, but you can actually dive the top laner a lot if your jungler starts at red buff. On red side, you can basically never dive and you should never play for that. As you can see, I'm not, I could be attacking the minions right now, but I'm, I'm not, I'm just making sure that I push a little bit. Now, a lot of champions are, can also auto attack the minions back or they have AOE abilities, right? Mordekaiser's Q can hit multiple minions. So you want to always make sure that you're just slightly pushing. If the other top laner is attacking the minions, you should also be attacking the minions. One of the reasons why it's so important to be pushing is so that you can get level two first and level three first and level four first. And with these level up timers, you can uh, deal with the enemy top laner. All I'm going to be doing is try to deny him CS push as slow as possible, CS as well as I can, and sometimes I have the option to auto attack him and I don't take it because all I want to do is CS. Using your Q for CS is always fine. You usually want to uh, ward after the second wave just because uh, sometimes they do like three camps into gank. Here I knew that Mordekaiser's gank setup isn't the best as he is a very long cooldown so I knew that I would be pretty safe. 
And in general, uh, you can let the wave push back, but what I really want to prevent is him getting level 4 first and then pushing the wave and me getting stuck over here. I want to dictate when I base. So while he is under the tower, I keep uh, CSing the minions to make sure that I get level 4 after one minion here. Just keep auto attacking, just keep pushing. It's not so important to deny the enemy. He has Dorn Shield, Second Wind. He's not gonna die so easily. All you want is resources for yourself. Because I CS like a complete maniac, uh, what I do something very funny, yeah? which he goes to ward, he shoves. This is a cannon wave, the fifth wave, I think. I just straight up base for Boots of Swiftness. Since I have W, I have Celerity and Boots of Swiftness, I have 470 movement speed right now. I based as soon as I could. So I run back to lane and yes, I'm, go I'm gonna miss some CS, but the thing is, if you play Ignite, you can't TP back to lane. You're gonna need to give up some some uh, minions in the end. So it de always depends on your lane state, but once you have a thousand gold, you need to spend that thousand gold. So try to find a cannon wave, push it in and then base. Even if you miss a few minions here, I missed three melee minions, but I would have missed some minion at some point. I can now get back into the lane, even though I'm a level down since I've got such a movement speed advantage. I can just keep slow pushing this wave again and take back control of the lane. Even you need a lot of matchup specific knowledge as Timo. Here I know that even if he gets level 6, since he only has a Dorn Shield, there's no way he can kill me. So until he bases, I'm completely safe. But since I'm not really putting him under pressure, he's probably gonna wait a lot until he TPs. So I know I'm safe for a long time. Yeah, you don't always get such a base off. Sometimes you just base after the third wave because you know that your jungle is coming. That's how you avoid ganks. And yeah, I could be freezing this, but I want to force out ATP here, for example, and I want to deal damage to the plates. Uh, you deal less damage before five minutes to the tower. So in general, um, the most important part of the lane is going to be between L 11 and 30 minutes where you're going to be playing as much for the plates as possible. Even though you crash a very big wave in the early game, don't overfocus on the waves because it's going to screw up the tempo of your lane a ton. Starting level 6, a shroom and one auto attack destroys the backline minions, so in most matchups you can guarantee that you shove out the wave. Next concept, between 6 minutes and 6.30, a plant spawns. So another reason why you wanna always be pushing is so that you can take the plant. Yeah, I'm waiting for it. It spawns at 6.17. And bam. I didn't spend some time harassing him for no reason. I don't really get anything from harassing him, right? I take the plant, I make sure that I'm safe, and I see us. I have coal, I'm out... I'm out doing him just by living. I'm already 600, uh, 500 gold ahead. And here, like I could be harassing him, but that's, in my opinion, a waste of time. I wanted to take the Skull Crab, but then I noticed, oh wait, Leeson is here. And that's another bonus of having priority, having push. You can rotate, he has a hard time rotating. And right now, this wave will eventually push back into me, because it's closer to his tower. So I can arrest the jungler here. I don't often do that, but right, if you can get it off, it's very impactful. I don't overstay for too long here, though. So, actually, my Viego really wants to go in. And I believe we end up killing him. Nope. Yeah, we forced out the slash. I wanted to go back because I actually missed quite a lot of CS. So in that way, I was actually going against my principles. CS and XP is more important than anything else. Here, I had the option to auto attack him. But I actually auto attack the tower because I want the plates. Um, if you get into the shoes of the melee top laner, if you just stand there Back to CS while the ranged top laner is just attacking your tower, it feels so bad. You don't want them to get the plates, but you can't really stop them. That, another thing that I just did, I'm gonna come back, is when the wave comes back, you wanna push anyways, sure Shroom is good, but right, how do you stop the Mordekaiser from CSing these minions? You do it by throwing the Shroom, and then he backs off from the minions. I don't need to kill this Mordekaiser, but I want to deny him minions. Now once again, I have push, I made sure that I had a reset. So even though he has TP, we have the same amount of items. And I can secure Herald. Herald allows your team to uh, snowball really hard. 
And I only missed one minion for that. I also got 100 gold. So that's why it's more important not to fuck up in your lane and play very consistently because then you can set up Herald and win the game through that. Usually you can only kill when you have Ignite. So when your Ignite is down, you can be like, oh, okay, I'm never killing him. Like here, I made a mistake, for example. I auto-attacked him when I could have auto-attacked this like four more times. And yeah, this is your thought process, like, right? I'm already a thousand gold ahead, but I'm not really doing anything, right? Like, you wouldn't think that I'm stomping my lane, but I have a 30 CS lead, I have a 2 plate lead, I harassed the jungle, I got the herald, and yeah, I'm already extremely far ahead. And I'm completely stomping the lane. And now I'm basically gonna rinse it, repeat, keep pushing, we have deep vision. And when I know that I can't harass him or the tower, I go for the skull crab. Here, my jungler stole it away from me. Now, finally, he based. I can buy a full item. I run back to lane. I always press W when I can. That's another bonus of Swifties. You are back in lane extremely quickly. Also, here I took a bad trade, but because I have fleet footwork, I can heal back up the full. I went Nashers. As I said in my guide, Nashers is a luxury item. So here I can just afford it, and I want to take a lot of jungle camps. I stopped taking blue buff here because I want to make sure that my wave is always pushed. And if something happens, I can take the blue buff later on. And yeah, now I go back and I, I just try to take jungle camps. He actually flashes for the blue buff, but it doesn't work out, which is kind of funny. I start making a bunch of mistakes after this, but this is exactly 50 minutes. This is like the ideal game plan that you want. Um, a lot of enemies aren't gonna push you as much as they could, especially in lower elos. So if you can get this kind of consistent gameplay, right? I didn't do anything special. I'm just pushing, I have 10 CS per minute, I invade the jungle when I can, I take skull crap when I can, I have prior for herald when I can, I base when I have good buys. And of course, like, I just want to show you if the enemy isn't actively punishing you and jumping onto you, you can build extreme leads. And one more thing to note, like, as I mentioned once again, once you build such a big lead, I'm 2,000 gold up on him. That's how you just stomp the uh, mid game. You push the tower, you push for tier 2, you get more CS, you take Baron at 20 minutes, and 80% of your wins are gonna be through such simple snowball. The game is very simple. Oftentimes, you very don't even leave uh, this quadrant. And sure, sometimes the team is just gonna lose, but... It's better to just play for yourself, be very strong, deny the enemy jungler, and then just react to the game as it happens. But the first step is to be strong yourself. Yeah, I'll probably show you guys a weak side game in a second. Now you might be wondering, okay, Alan, if I play against a shit Mordekaiser who never does anything to me and lets me get away with the game, sure, I can snowball. But what do I do if I'm against something like Nidalee Renekton? Two extremely strong early game champions who can get on top of you, who can screw you over. And what do I do if I'm weak sided? What if I never get any gank? Well, in this game, I'm against an extremely heavy early game team comp, and Panunu, I believe, never really comes top lane. So, let's see how I handle this situation. Now, as I mentioned, I never leash, I always check the tribush, and I never push it too quickly in the early game. I only attack the minions a little bit. In this game, I just have Dark Seal refillable potion. Another very important concept is that when you attack someone, you take minion aggro. The only way to reliably reset minion aggro and to not die from your own poke is to go into the bushes. So in basically every landing phase, you're gonna see me play towards this. And this is another reason why you always wanna push because then you have control over the bushes. Bush control is legitimately really important. Here I could be attacking these minions, but I would be pushing too quickly and then he can CS earlier. So I'm still CSing as slowly as possible so that he misses these three minions. You wouldn't have missed them if I uh, pushed quickly. Just because you push quickly does not mean that your lane is better. Here I noticed that uh, the minions keep following me into the bush. That's a high elo thing that melee uh, top laners do. So I stopped playing towards this bush and I play towards here. I could have warded there, but I believe since I saw him come to lane late, I knew that uh, there was a leash. And yeah, 
basically knew that there was a leech and I was like, okay, worst case, I will fight in my lane and if I didn't get ganked by now, I probably won't get ganked. This ward is basically just for peace of mind. I place it as far away as possible so that I see the jungler as early as possible. Also by now, of course, I see the bot lane, so I'm Gucci. Here, once again, the only reason why I'm poking him is to the 9 CS. Already 10 minions. Again, 10 minions, that's like 200 gold. Not really, because range minions give less, but just imagine that it costs 20. Next up here. Yeah, like, once again, I want to go on this push and just 9 minions. In this case, unlike Mordekaiser, uh, he struggles more with playing at range. Oh. Okay. We're gonna see a gank once again. So here I'm focusing a bit less on just perma shoving him in. I still wanna always be able to guarantee a push, but I'm trying to keep the wave here so that I can harass him and keep him away from the minions. So here, because I did the ward as far as possible, I see her. I take the cannon, they ping me. I, I believe I didn't actually see her, but my team saw her walk through here. So your first instinct when you get ganked, go towards the bushes. Next, if you walk like this immediately, they're gonna follow you. You wanna walk in the middle of the bush so that they probably think that you're running over here. But what do I actually do? Right, she even places this thing. As soon as you walk into the bush, uh, the ticker for your passive, the 1.5 seconds, actually starts. So, I walk like this, and even though he flashes, he's not able to stun me. And now, a Nidalee Q would actually give vision on me. So, I flash out, and I live. And bam, I wasted her time. Yes, the wave is in a bad state, because I... If I was better at jungle tracking, I could have known that she's there and pushed in and then based. That's what I would have done if I was a really good player, and you could also do. But here, I have enough gold to have a decent base. Here, I just feel like they are so squishy, and I don't really respect this Renekton. I feel like he's playing very passively that I can get away with Sock Shoes, but of course you can go like uh, Swifties with Cloth Armor, for example, or Dagger. I would have loved to auto attack the minions here, but I knew that uh, since he just got a wave <coughs> and I didn't, that he would be level 6, so I didn't want to play too aggressively. Once again, <coughs> I positioned towards the river so that I could take the plant. Plant makes a huge difference between who wins those levels. Yeah, I poke him, but I mostly poke him because uh, Nuno is fighting against Nidalee. Yeah, I can reset here. I, I do end up respecting them. And she pops old early, she queues, but yeah. You just need to respect them, especially if you have W. But because of your small size, your W, celerity, and tier 2 boots, I'm able to easily run away from the situation. So even though Nidalee is top lane again and I don't have flash, I can easily survive. If I had to flash here and he didn't need to flash, then I wouldn't have approached this bush at all. I would have just said we can't 2v2. And now, yeah, I know that his ult is down, so... Easy CSing. You basically always want to be either hard hard shoving so that you can get all your items, or you want to be CSing really slowly to build up big waves. It's called slow push and hard push. I don't know where he is and I know that he has no TP. So I'm down to push it out quickly. Ah. Here's a fun concept. First of all, you should be very happy to see uh, to see the enemy top laner buy pings because once again I talked about efficient usage of your gold. He had to waste 75 gold on a pink ward and I'm gonna get 30 gold for it. So this was a 100 gold swing, basically a wave for no real reason. Like this pink ward doesn't actually give him anything. So whenever he places a pink ward, be very happy because that means that he has wasted his gold, essentially. I also never buy control wards because when you have your uh, vision ward and your shrooms, you don't really need them. Now, next thing. Some people will try to avoid your shrooms. Like here, he wants to avoid it, but in the process, 
he's going to um, allow me to create way more distance. Like he saw me throw the shroom here. He's gonna allow me to build up way more distance than he actually needs to. He could have just all int me and probably killed me. But instead, I'm allowed to kite him. And because he wanted to avoid the shrooms, I end up killing him. Another thing is, champions that can get onto you, I really like, like for example, against Akali. I very often buy like a Ruby Crystal. And this game, I'm actually going Crown. Because I feel like when you go Landry, you just get killed too easily. And if you check their team comp, if I get Nautilus ulted or Renekton flashes onto me, I'm kind of dead. But with Crown, I can actually live. So that's why my build is pretty is like this. Now I don't have any vision on Nidalee, so I just run back. Yeah. As you can see, I always tried to be pushing a little bit. I didn't play as much for the place here because he has so much threat. I went for the... I went for the plant when I could. I tracked the jungler whenever I could. And in the end, I'm up more than a thousand gold, even though I didn't get that many plates. Simply by playing intelligently, getting as much CS as I can. Like, again, like, if you have 110 CS at 40 minutes, it sounds okay, right? But you're down like 20 CS, you're down three waves. Like, why didn't you get those three waves? Always think about it. Like, 10 CS per minute is very achievable if you don't die multiple times. In general, that's something that Lois also mentions. Try to minimize deaths. Solo queue is a marathon, and Timo is very good at denying enemy champions. So, especially a Renekton who wants to snowball. Like, oftentimes your one condition is don't die, deny enemy. 70% of the time you win. 30% of the time you can't do anything, but that's just the game. It might be boring, but it's very methodical, and that's how you squeeze the enemy top laner out, and you just become way more useful. So now, I'm up one and a half thousand gold. I had prior for both heralds, and it is a complete top gap. I ended up completely outscaling him with my team, and even though Right, our team doesn't look so scary. We easily finished the game by like 24 minutes. We just straight up end the game. Because Timo is a very good scaler. The rest of my team scales well as well. They got outscaled. He's stuck on two items. I'm already building my third. And we won. So that is your general game plan as Timo. Now let's talk about some general questions and when Timo is actually strong. Now, I want to tell you when Timo is strong in general and what kind of item spikes and uh, level spikes you want to play around with. As I said, in most matchups, you can get early push. So level 1, 2, and 3, you're usually stronger. You need to be careful when you are at the enemy tower, especially if they get level 4 first, that's why you counter push the wave. Level 4 and 5, a lot of champions can actually deal a lot of hurt to you. It depends on the matchup always, a lot of champions you can match, but you are sometimes a bit weaker. And level 6 depends, a Quinn might not be able to do anything, but a Renekton is just straight up stronger than you. Now, level 7, level 8 is a lot of, is where a lot of champions start to come online. Like for example, Malphite might not be scary in the early game, like after level 7, level 8, level 9. He can actually become quite scary, their cooldowns become lower, Aatrox becomes harder, so... Again, some matchups you still stomp at this point, but... It is okay if from like level 7 to level 10 you feel a bit weaker. Level 11 is where you get your level 2 ult, and at this point you can basically one-shot any wave by just throwing uh, a Shroom with it, especially if you have Lyandry. So, you can just negate most champions. And also, this is where, in my opinion, like if you get multiple points in the W, you start to feel a lot faster. You get your first and second item. And since you're usually snowballing the lead from your lane, like right, you're pretty strong level 1 to 4. And then like starting level 11 after you build up your lead. You might not be very strong in the general 1v1, but because you can control the wave, you can poke and you can make the enemy top laner weaker, you can still be comparatively stronger. And then in my opinion with every level, you might become stronger and stronger. And starting level 16, you have a huge room throw range. 
and with that, and you have five rooms, Emo becomes one of the best late game champions in the game. Those are the level orders in general. Early game, very strong. Level 11, starting from that level, very strong again. Your most important task is to bridge the gap between early game and level 11, which, as I showed you before, you do through wave management. Let's talk about some shroom locations. Now, in general, you should never forget that shrooms are only up on the map for 5 minutes. So if you place a shroom at 10 minutes, by 50 minutes it's gone. So make sure that the shrooms that you place in the early game actually have some value. Don't just throw a shroom to provide vision in this bush, if probably no one's gonna play around this bush at all. At this point you're just wasting uh, the 75 mana that it costs and you might as well just spam your Q on the enemy champion. So it's also okay if you have shrooms in reserve so that you can actually use them when you need them. Only in the like late game you should probably make sure to only have 4 shrooms. What are the best room locations? First of all, you need to remember that there are minions. So a minion wave is gonna come soon. This is a horrible shroom. Because, very simply said, the minions are gonna walk into it. And sometimes you will have a pushing wave even when you don't have it. In general, try to stick shrooms pretty close to walls because you do not want shrooms to accidentally proc them. Also, you can use this arrow as a guideline where the tower sees it. I don't know where if it's exact, but like around here a shroom, the tower probably doesn't see. Around here a shroom, probably doesn't see. But like here a shroom, you're gonna see that. Because the minions come through here and suddenly they're cluttered up, even this is probably too close to a minion wave. You wanna try to have your shrooms somewhat close to the wall, but not so close that they never walk into it. Now my favorite shroom locations are these shrooms over here. Because when people run, they don't want to go in the bush, but like, let's say you chase them. They want to run like this back to the tower and they run through. Or they run, they check the bush, they know that it's safe, but then later on when you chase them, they start to run and you kill them through here. Same here, if they run like this, they usually run into the tower. This location is pretty tricky because like this probably will get procced by a minion. This will get procced by a minion. This this people are gonna walk past. What I usually like to do around this area is pretty good. I like placing it actually like more here because if they place a pink ward here, they do not see the shroom. This shroom would be seen. So realistically, around this location is the best. You can mirror the shroom, right? So really, this shroom, this shroom, this room and this room are the only ones that I would place during the game. Also, sometimes it's scary to check for vision over here, like right, you're not level 16 in lane. You can just throw shroom here, and if you ever get ganked by the enemy jungler, they're probably gonna come like this. They're gonna walk into the shroom. So this is enough to like secure you enough vision. And yeah, that's basically it about shrooms. I use shrooms a lot in the early laning phase to the 9 minutes under tower by throwing it into the wave and then he has to concede a big big radius or by just pushing waves because if I push waves then I can be on the map earlier, I can base faster, etc. Only use your shrooms to like really set up objectives yeah, later on, like st starting level 11 basically. And yeah, the rest of your shrooms should just be intuition. There's not like a strict rule. Try to place them where people might not expect them. Like they would expect them here, but they're gonna walk through it like here. Let's say the jungler does crux, he's gonna walk through here. So I mentioned a lot that what makes me one of the best team players is that I am very adaptable. So you will see me build and take a bunch of different runes every single game. However, you don't need to do that. Just choose a setup that I mentioned that you like and just use it. Try to focus a lot more on being a good player than being a good builder. Of course, you make your life a lot easier if you have the correct room. And I have a matchup sheet and a matchup guide that I will post in the description. But in general, these are just like information so that you can adapt if you want to and you can understand my uh, thought process, but you don't need to do this. So here, I'm against a Cassandra. Usually, I would go Landry into Cassandra. However, I often build not for my enemy lane opponent, 
but for the entire team. Here I see a Renga and a Syndra. Both of them that can basically one-shot me and sometimes like if I try to Zonya a Syndra combo, then well, she's still just gonna kill me once I come out of uh, Zonya. So here I go Crown of the Shattered Queen. I also have a Sona, so I go Oblivion Orb and I want Nasher to contest um, Desante in the fights. I went needlessly loud rod because I was actually planning on going Shadow Flame. Once again, the, everyone has a shield because of Sona. Next example. Here, I finally found out my setup against uh, Jax, which is face rush with bone plating. So this is match of specific knowledge that you can also learn. Here, I went Lucidity Boots because they've got so many alt attackers and I want to have both Flash against Ari and Pike. And I just want to have more blinds against their alt attackers. Once again, if I ever get hooked, I just die. And also Jax has so much pressure in their early laning phase that I go crown. Shadow Flame purchase here isn't the best, honestly, but I just had money for it. I think I was going for Death Cap, but then I had exact money for it. And Zonya makes a lot of sense since they have reset champions. Here, this is the Mordekaiser game that I showed you. I went Nashor to snowball my lead. USS, Nash of specific knowledge, because he has a Zolt, and then Zonya because I have a Talon, Oblivion Orb against Araka. Here I told you, you can also go with Send. I went with Send Riftmaker twice in a row. Why? It's act it's pretty ugly, but it gets the job done. You need the MR to survive the laning phase against Rise or against Grumble. These are very good players on their champions, and then that's honestly often not enough. I also went Riftmaker just so that I can survive. Timo, as long as he can survive, a lot of the time he provides so much value that building defensive items is pretty good. That's once again why I mentioned that like Nashor or Deathcap are luxury items. You build them if you have a good game where nothing can threaten you, you're really fed. But usually, especially in high elo, you need some sort of defensive item because else you're kind of just dying. This game, for example, I actually had a very easy game. No one was really going on to me besides the Syndra and I had other people who could deal with it. I was against a Vayne. So I just went full AP here and I had way too much damage. I went Deathcap third into Shadow Flame just because I wanted my Q to hit like a truck. And then I went Sork Shoes, as I mentioned, pretty good when you go a high damage build. This was also with Airy and five points into Q. Then, um, yeah, here I was against a Kale. It's actually pretty difficult for me to auto attack because Kale will have a higher range, Victor has a higher range, Sun has a somewhat higher range. So I did not go in attack speed item. I just went Landry and then I was doing pretty well, 10 CS per minute. I just went death cap so that every next item that I build is going to be more effective. I started building some MR after I started building death cap, so I go void stuff here. Those are my examples. I hope that teaches you a little bit like what my thought process is as I build items. So thank you for watching such a long guide for such a long time. Now I'm gonna uh, answer some of the most common questions that my chat I stream on twitch.tv slash alantimo. And hopefully uh, if you had some sort of question, this will answer it. If not, uh, please comment down below and I will answer it first. Now, first question by Zexas. Are you often happy if the jungler camps you and gives you space for your team? No. I don't like getting camped by my jungler. Getting a dive off is really nice and getting a counter gank off is really nice. But in general, I, ca I can't solo carry the team. Timo is not a carry, he's more of a fa facilitator. So in general, I want my jungler to move away from me, help bot lane. Because if I am even and slightly ahead and my bot lane is the same, we're gonna win far more than if I'm really ahead but my bot lane is behind. So in general, I like to play without my jungler unless I like really really need help, but that usually means that I fucked up my lane at some stage of the game. EKXS Mansion asks, is there any matchup where you go grasp instead of uh, lead footwork for sustain? Grasp is a very good lane uh, rune for the lane. However, it is a lot weaker than Fleet Footwork right now. Maybe once they change the numbers in very difficult matchups that is also poke heavy, like for example Gangplank, I will start going Grasp again. But however, right now Fleet Footwork is the best. Maybe next season 
runes are gonna change because Riot always changes something. You might start going Grasp again, but Fleet Footwork is still very nice. I think it's actually getting buffed. Kerry Konavo asks, have I tried Timo jungle? I have tried it. I have won with it in Challenger. Timo is a good power jungler. He has a lot of DPS on jungle minions. If he gets two successful full clears, he can actually carry harder than even like Karthus, Nocturne, etc. would. However, he's a bit susceptible in the early game and the biggest problem is that your team is gonna have an aneurysm. So, in general, Timo jungle, a little bit difficult. What do I do with a losing team? Everyone asks that. Some games, you just lose. You do your best, you take the skirmishes that you can, but in general, try to make yourself as strong as possible. You can influence your own decisions, you can't influence the decisions of your team. So that's why I don't like my jungler being on my lane as well. I can't influence whether his decision is a good one or a bad one. I'd rather just make sure that the lane is dictated by my own decisions. If I am strong and in a side lane, I can get more resources and I can maybe get uh, them to come into me and then I 1v2 or something. I want them to run into me where I have my shroom field set up in the top lane rather than running into them joining a random team fight. If it's 25 minutes, soul is up, 4th dragon, yes, you will need to join. Your team is weaker, but yeah, sometimes you just lose, try to play for yourself, try to get the tier 2s and then just play for dragon and baron. The shrooms are pretty good for that. Another question, what do you do against a fat enemy carry who can one-shot you? Um, in general, as I mentioned, I itemize for the biggest threat of the enemy team. So even if I'm against a Cassante, if they've got a Syndra, I'm itemizing against a Syndra because the Syndra has a bigger threat to me. So if they have a Talon who's giga fed, a Kane who's giga fed, I'm still gonna go Zonya even if I'm playing against Heimerdinger or something because at the end of the day, you should try to itemize for him. If they have one champion who's extremely fed and everyone else is weak, one pro tip is to actually go Anathema's Chains. Very cheap item, gives a lot of HP, reduces damage, that's how you can win. How do I handle slope pushing where I don't know where the jungler is? So you're pushing the lane, however the enemy top is threatening to freeze and you don't know where the jungler is. First of all, try to think where he could be. Sometimes it's worth it to just suicide for the wave, so you push it out no matter what so that it pushes back into you. But something very simple that you can do is the enemy top laner might not allow you to sh shove it in fully, but he can't really stop you from just throwing a shroom on the wave. You might miss all of the CS, but as long as the wave crashes, you're gonna be okay. So in general, just start throwing waves into the shroom, to force it to push, depending on the champion of course. If they try to freeze, they might take a lot of damage, then you can go for a 2v1 or chill, depends on the situation. A rune specific question, Transcendence versus Celerity versus Absolute Focus in the Sorcery Tree Minor Runes. In general, Transcendence is kinda whatever. I like Celerity the most, but Absolute Focus is okay if you're going Airy, Qmax uh, for full AP, probably with a Death Cat. Then this actually has quite a lot of value. A question from Timothy. If there are a lot of tanks, let's say three of them, do you ever consider going Borg or AP Rageblade, or is it always just Landry? Um, in general, I, Borg, I think right now is just a horrible item, and Rageblade is kind of whatever as well. I showed you what items I think are in general good, and I think going for them is a bait. Uh, usually, like, Landry and Asher is gonna be just as effective against a tank as is Borg Rageblade, and you will be way more useful in teamfights as well. So don't try to overcook. So I think that's it with the guides. <laughs> Never underestimate the power of the scout's code. Hut, code, hut, hut, code. Hut, hut, two, three, scout's four, code. Hut, 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 two, three, <laughs> four. Yes, sir.